Don't worry about it. Okay, so um, what I want to do is I want to provide you guys some motivation real quickly, okay? Because I think what can happen is I can stand up here and I can go blah, 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 and the blah, 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 blah and, and yeah, I know everything and just, just deal with it. But I want to provide some motivation. Why the heck do we, do we know what was going on and we know by experimentation? And so one of the experiments that was done the turn of the century, um, late 1800s, early 1900s, was we were taking gas-filled tubes. We take a tube of gas, okay, and we put an electrical potential across it, okay? And what happens when you take gas and you put a really strong electrical potential across that gas? What happens? It starts to, it glows. Yeah, it glows. And so we can do that with hydrogen, and it glows kind of a purple color, all right? And then somebody got the bright idea, hey, maybe if I could just poke a tiny, tiny, tiny little hole in there, okay, that, that excited gas will flow out, and we can study it. And um, that excited gas is something we call plasma. And so that's what they did. They poked it, they poked it out, and then some of that gas flew out, and then hit a screen back here, and we could see that it came out more or less in a straight line. And then somebody said, huh, what if I had a positive charge here and a negative charge here? I wonder what would happen there. And so they put a positive charge and a negative charge, and something really crazy happened. Okay, something really crazy happened. Okay. A, t a small part of the stream went way up here toward the positive charge, and then a part of the stream went just a little bit down here toward the negative charge. And so from this experiment, what we realized was that atoms were made of something. There was something inside of the atom, and there was something that must be very small and negatively charged because it moved a lot, right? If it's small, it's a lot easier to move something. And it moved toward the positive, right? So there must be some small, something small inside of the atom that's negatively charged. And then there must be something big inside of the atom that is positively charged, but we know it's big, we know it's massive because it didn't move as much as whatever that small thing was. Does that make sense? And from this experiment, okay, and many others, we came to realize or we came to understand um, what was going on with atoms, okay? And it, it took us, and we're still to this day trying to figure that out, um, a lot of the nuance. But I just wanted to show you how kind of a simple experiment and asking some questions can really lead to some really big answers. So the current understanding of the atom is that the atom really contains three components, okay? It contains three components, okay? It contains very heavy or massive components, okay? And those tend to be centralized in what's known as the nucleus, okay? And these are large particles known as protons and neutrons. And protons have positive electrical charge, okay? And neutrons are neutral. They do not carry electrical charge. All right, so that might be a neutron. And protons and neutrons have roughly the same mass, about what we call one atomic mass unit, or one AMU. And then in a cloud, smeared out in a cloud around the, at the nucleus, we have these negatively charged particles, if you want to call them that, okay, that are attracted, okay, they are electrically attracted to the positively charged protons in the nucleus, and they're held in place, okay, and those are known as electrons. You guys okay with that? Now, the picture, an easy way of, of, of viewing this is that these electrons orbit, okay, they orbit around the nucleus, kind of like a planet orbits the sun, kind of like the Earth orbits the sun. Unfortunately, that model breaks down, and I'm, I'm not gonna be able to talk about it in any detail, but it is one kind of way of looking at the atom. Really, what we, we, we found out is that 
the electron is actually smeared out in a cloud of probability. Okay? We don't know exactly where it is, okay? but there's, just a, there's certain probability associated with where it might be if we took a look, and that's about as good as it gets. So what I will say instead is that instead of the electrons orbiting, they exist in what are called shells, energy shells, around the nucleus. You guys okay with that? Um, some people may use the term orbital. They exist in orbitals. Okay? An orbital is an area of high probability of finding an electron at a certain energy level. But for us, it's, it's more convenient to look at this as energy shells, shells of energy, okay, around the nucleus. You guys okay with that? So far so good, is, that, is there too much noise coming to the, the door there? You guys okay? You guys okay? All right, cool. Uh, I'll just keep that open for, for the time being, I guess. All right, so that's the basic motivation, all right? You guys okay so far? So what we need to now understand is most of the chemistry, virtually all of chemistry, all of atomic bonding, all of atoms making molecules, all of breaking down, all of chemical reactions, really comes down to one concept, and that is the outer electrons. The outermost electrons, the electrons in the outer shell of an atom are the ones that are involved in all the chemistry, all the bonding, all of the chemical reactions. And we call the outer shell of an atom the valence shell. The valence shell. Okay? And it are these, these valence electrons that are the, the electrons that give each atom its unique properties. And an atom that has these unique properties, of course, is called an element. Okay? You guys good so far? So what I want you to do is I want you to take a look at your periodic table that I gave you guys. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to make some sense of the periodic table real quick before we start talking about how atoms can make molecules. You guys you guys, good with that? So far so good? Am I, have I lost anybody or are you guys, guys tracking? Tracking like a pawn shop VCR so far so good? All right, good, good. All right, so valence electrons are the ones that we care about. All right, so if you look at the periodic table of elements, let's start at the simplest element, the most fundamental element, and that is hydrogen. That is at big H on the very top, all the way there on the left-hand side of the periodic table. You guys see that okay? Now, um, hydrogen is one of the most common and one of the most important elements. And in fact, only about four elements are required for 95% of all of life, okay? 95% of every molecule in your body is made up of one of four of these, these atoms. And I just remember con, carbon, okay? That has the atomic symbol C, okay? Hydrogen, all right, atomic H, oxygen, O and nitrogen. In ninety-five percent of biology comes down to these four atoms, and then the other five percent things like phosphorus and um, trace elements. But ninety-five percent of these. So let's start at hydrogen. Hydrogen. If you look at the periodic table, you'll see that there'll be a big H. That's the atomic symbol that tells you what kind of element we're dealing with. And then you're going to see a whole number, a 1. You guys see that there? That 1, that whole number, it's not a decimal, it's just a whole number, is the atomic number. And the atomic number is a fingerprint for an atom. It's a fingerprint for an element. And the atomic number tells us how many protons, how many protons that specific element has in it. So how many protons does hydrogen have? One proton. One proton. You guys cool? Now, for every, in a po proton has what kind of charge? Positive. positive. So for every positive, there should be a? Negative. negative. So if we know how many protons we, we have, we should also know how many? Electrons. 
the electrons. So how many electrons does hydrogen have? One. One, okay? So the atomic number tells us most of the information that we need to know about the, the chemical reactivity of the element, okay? So the atomic number is one, one proton, okay? That also means that we have one electron. You guys cool with that? So far so good? Now, what's, we can also use the periodic table of elements to tell us information about the valence shell, because that's what we want to know, right? The valence shell. Now, hydrogen is super simple because it only has one electron, so there's not a whole lot of guessing that goes on. But if you look at the periodic table of element, it is divided into horizontal rows, okay, horizontal rows called periods. Hence the term periodic table. Hydrogen, and then if you go all the way to the right, there's helium there. Do you see that? Hydrogen, helium. That's the first row. And that is the N. Do you see that on the side there, on the left-hand side? N is 1. That is the first row, first period. Do you guys see that? Hydrogen and helium are in the first period. And then in 2, if you go a row below that, you have lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and helium, right? Those are all in the second period. And then the third period, if you look at the third period, what do you have? Um, uh, is it sodium? Sodium, magnesium, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. And then the fourth, potassium, I believe, et cetera, et cetera. You guys okay with that? Okay, the period. Whatever period that element is in, that tells us how many shells of energy, how many energy levels there are around that nucleus. So hydrogen has how many energy levels? One, One right? How many electrons does it have? One. Well, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it, right? <laughs> okay. Um, but if I look at carbon, for example, how many energy levels are there around carbon? How many shells of, ener of energy are there? Two. Two shells. You guys okay with that? You guys cool with that? Okay, so if you look at um, argon, AR, okay, what, how many sh energy levels are there? How many shells are there around argon? Three. Three shells. You guys cool with that? Now, which shell do we care about, though? The valence shell, right? The outermost shell. The outermost shell. Okay, you guys cool with that? So the period tells us how many shells of energy there are. And then you also have these columns, these vertical columns, okay? And these columns are called groups, all right? So if you look all the way over at hydrogen there, hydrogen, lithium, magnesium, no, no. Hydrogen, lithium, sodium, excuse me, potassium, rubidium, etc. All of those elements in that column, what, what column is that? What group is that? If you look on top, is there a number on top? One. One. Okay, so the period that an element is in, whatever it period is, is how many levels of energy there are around that nucleus. The group number, okay, that tells us how many valence electrons that particular atom has. You guys cool with that? Okay. So, how many levels of energy does hydrogen have? One. One. Okay. How many electrons does it have? One. And how many electrons are in its valence shell? One. One. Well, how easy is that, right? You guys cool with that? Um, cool. Let's look at helium. Helium is in what period? Okay, so how many levels of energy are there around helium? One. Okay, how many electrons does it have total? Two. Okay, how many protons does it have? Two. Good. How many valence electrons does it have? Eight. Eight? Two. Yeah, ooh, there's something crazy going on here. And this is the next important point that you guys need to know. It is a rule of thumb. And the general rule of thumb is most atoms, most elements are stable. They are stable when they have eight electrons in their valence shell. 
They are most stable when they have eight electrons in their valence shell. And this is something known as the octet rule. Octet rule. You guys call it that? The octet rule. Now, one of the exceptions to the octet rule happens to be elements in the first period. Okay? And elements in the first period are happy when they have two electrons in their valence shell. You guys okay? Is that, is that confusing or do you, you guys, you guys cool with that? Okay. So elements in the first period, so that really only applies to hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen and helium are happy with only two electrons. And the reason being is the maximum number of electrons that we can put in that first shell is two. You guys cool with that? And then it's full. So they act like they have an octet, right? So that's why helium is over in that eight, because it's happy, it's stable, it's happy, it acts just like it has a octet. And so if you look over on the eighth column there, on the far right, all of the elements in that column have eight electrons in their valence shell. Their valence shell is full, these are stable, and these are atoms that do not chemically react a whole lot. They're not chemically reactive. And some people call these the inert or noble gases. So things like helium, neon, argon, krypton, uh, I think krypton and xenon are in there as well. They are more or less inert. They're not chemically reactive because they have a full octet. So would it be this row too since it's eight? No, anything in the middle if you look in the very center of the periodic table of elements, you see that center block there? Mm -hmm. And then the one underneath? Those are, those are special, okay? <laughs> those are special, and um, well, we're not really gonna talk about them. Those are what we call uh, the transition metals. Um, and they, they can have multiple states where they're happy and unhappy. Um, so they are, completely exceptions to all the rules. <laughs> the so rules don't apply to them. The number comes to the number of electrons, right? In the valence, okay. in the valence shell, right? In the valence shell, yeah. So those guys in the middle, they break all the rules, okay? They're the rule breakers. Um, so we won't really talk about them. But all the other elements, the elements on the far left and the far right, follow the octet rule. And the elements that make up 95% of what life is follow those rules. So the octet rule is a, is, is, a, is a good one to start at. It's a good starting point. You guys cool with that? So it is, this is what drives most of chemistry, is that these atoms want to get at a point where they have eight electrons in their valence shell. Does that make sense? That's what makes something chemically reactive. If it does not have its octet rule met, it will try to meet its octet rule, and that is what causes chemical reactivity. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to talk about some different ways that atoms can react, okay? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna give you a basic demonstration. I want you guys to look up chlorine, Cl, okay? And I'm going to draw the valence shell of chlorine, and I want you to tell me how many electrons does chlorine have in its valence shell? Seven. Seven. And what I'm going to do is the electrons, I'm going to draw them as dots. Even though we know that they're not <coughs> dots, it's just kind of handy to, to draw them as dots, or what we call Lewis dots. So one, two, and I'm going to pair them up. Three, four, Five, six, well, I've got this little guy here, but I only have seven, so he can't pair up. So is the octet rule met with chlorine? No. no, it's not. And then what I want you guys to do is I want you to look at sodium. That's Na. I want you to look at sodium. And how many electrons does sodium have in its octet, or its valence shell, excuse me? It has one electron in its valence shell. <coughs> How many total shells of electrons are there around sodium, though? Sodium is in what? It's in the third, right? OK. 
Okay. And the first shell is full at how many? How many electrons fills the first shell? Two. Okay. So sodium, its first shell is full at two, right? And then I have the second shell. How many total electrons am I dealing with in sodium? Three. How many total electrons? What's the atomic number? Eleven. Eleven, Eleven right? So we know that the first shell that sodium has is full at two, right? And then the valent shell has how many? How many? One. One. So how many electrons must be in the second shell? Eight. Oh, okay. So the second shell has eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I've accounted for all eleven electrons. You guys okay with that? Yeah. Cool. Does that make sense? Easy. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put sodium and chlorine together. And how many electrons does chlorine need to meet its octet rule? One more. It needs one more. How many electrons does sodium need? Seven. Seven. It needs seven. Let me, let me, let me rephrase it, though. Atoms are kind of like people, OK? And do people like to do things difficult? They don't have to be difficult. No. no. Do you think it's going to be really difficult for sodium to somehow get a hold of seven more electrons? It's going to be kind of difficult, isn't it? But what could sodium do? What's something that would be maybe easier for sodium to do? Just to get one. Oh, and chlorine, <clears throat> how many electrons does chlorine need? One. It just needs one, huh? So what if sodium were to give up its valence electron, and it gives its valence electron to chlorine here? You guys cool with that? All right. So sodium loses an electron, chlorine gains an electron. That Now how many electrons does sodium have in its valence shell? Eight. Eight, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? The outer, the valence. Is that cool? How many electrons does chlorine have? Eight. Has eight. Are there octet rules met? Yes. But what happens when you lose a negative charge? You become positively charged, right? Because how many protons does sodium have? Eight. Has 11 protons, right? Mm -hmm. It has 11 positive charges. And how many negative charges does it have now? Nine. 10, right? So it has one more positive charge than it has negative, right? So sodium becomes positively charged. Likewise, chlorine gains an electron, or it gains a negative charge. So what happens to chlorine? It's it becomes negatively charged, the whole atom. When this happens, when an atom either gains or loses an electron, that atom becomes an ion. Okay, an ion, an ion is an atom that has either lost or gained an electron. It either has a positive or negative charge. You guys cool with that? That's what an ion is. <clears throat> and what do we know about opposites in nature? Opposites what? Attract. So what's going to happen is the sodium is going to be attracted to the chlorine, and they're going to combine together. And whenever you have negative and positively charged ions coming together, that is known as an ionic bond. <clears throat> and so the sodium and chlorine come together to create something known as sodium chloride or table salt. Now we know that individually sodium and chlorine are very toxic, right? Chlorine in nature is a toxic greenish gas. And if you inhale this chlorine, that chlorine starts tearing because it wants to get a hold of an electron, right? It starts tearing electrons out of your airways and it destroys the cells in your airway. Um, sodium is actually an explosive metal. Sodium wants to get rid of its electron, right? 
And like if sodium were to, were to react with water, right, there would be an explosion that would occur. Um, so we actually have to store sodium in, in, in oils to prevent it from being explosive. But when sodium gives its electron to chlorine and they combine, these really toxic substances, these toxic elements become a relatively inert, right? Nobody's afraid of table salt unless you eat too much of it, right? You have really high blood pressure and you eat a lot of salt. But generally, we're not afraid of it blowing up if we put it in our pocket, right? We're not afraid of inhaling deadly lung-destroying fumes from it. <coughs> Does that make, is, are you guys good with that? Okay, so that's what we call an ionic bond. Anytime ions, okay, a positive and a negative, anytime a, a one atom gives an electron to another and then they come together to form a molecule, and a molecule is just the combination of two or more atoms, okay? Whenever two or more ions come together, an ion is just an atom with, that has either gained or lost an electron, when that happens, we call that an ionic bond. You guys cool with that? Now, only certain types of substances can do this, though. So what I want you to do is I want you to look at your periodic table of elements, and do you see on the right side, there's kind of like a little stair step kind of shape that I drew in there for you. Okay, everything to the left of that stair step is what's known as a metal. And I think I drew that in there for you guys, okay? So pretty much everything on the left-hand side of the periodic table of element is a metal. So sodium, lithium, okay, magnesium, calcium, all those are metals. And metals like to give up electrons. That's what makes metals metal. They like to give up electrons. They lose electrons. You guys cool with that? Now, the, to the right of that stair step are non-metals. You guys cool with that? Non-metals like to receive. They like to take electrons. And the further you get to the right, the more those non-metals want to get a hold of an electron until you get to the very last column, the noble gases, and their shell is full, right? But the closer you get to having a full valence shell, the more you want to get a hold of an electron. So fluorine, for example, fluorine is highly, highly reactive, like chlorine. It really wants to get a hold of an electron. Chlorine really wants to. Oxygen wants to, just not as much as fluorine. Nitrogen wants to, but not quite as much as oxygen. And carbon, okay, carbon can kind of go either way. It's like, well, I wouldn't mind getting a hold of some, but, you know, I can negotiate a little bit. And then the further you go left, okay, the more likely that atom is to want to give up electrons to meet its octet rule. You guys cool with that? Does that make sense? So I think the next question to ask is, well, what, so that explains metals and nonmetals, right? Ionic bonding is a metal and a nonmetal for the most part. Well, what about nonmetals and nonmetals? Is, is there a way that nonmetals and nonmetals can bond? Like, let's take, uh, uh, let's take, um, mm, what do I want to do? Um, let's take hydrogen. Let's take hydrogen and hydrogen. Even though it's more on the metal side, um, hydrogen's kind of its own special thing. Let's take hydrogen, hydrogen, okay. Let's take the same. So we, we, have a, we don't have a metal and non-metal situation here, right? We just have hydrogen, hydrogen. So how many electrons does hydrogen have, again? One. How many does it have in its valence? One. How many would it like to have in its valence? Two, Two because that would be full, a full valence shell, okay? So if I take a hydrogen and a hydrogen, and I put them next to each other, they both want an electron, right? What could they do, though? Share. Ah, they could share. Instead of give and take, like an ionic bond, they could share. So this hydrogen could say, hey, I'll share my electron with you if you share your electron with me. And they share electrons. And sharing of electrons is what we call a covalent, a covalent bond. You guys call it that? Covalent bonding. Let's 
take another example. Let's look at oxygen. Okay. How many valence electrons does oxygen have? Six. Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So here's an oxygen. Here's another oxygen. One, two, um, three, four, five, six. How many electrons does oxygen need? Two. Two. Do you see anything interesting here? How about I share this electron with you, you share that one with me. That's one bond, right? Mm -hmm. That's one covalent bond. And then I share this here, you share that there with me. That's a second covalent bond. So hydrogen, hydrogen molecules are just bound by one co covalent bond, right? Oxygen molecules, or O2, are double covalent bonded, right? That's two covalent bonds. And let's just take a look at nitrogen. Nitrogen has how many electrons in its valence shell? Five, right? So one, two, three, four, five. You guys cool with that? So I take a nitrogen here, I take a nitrogen here. One, two, three, four, five. How many sharing, how many bonds result here? Three. Right, I've got a bond here due to sharing, a bond here, and then a bond here or a nitrogen molecule that is triple covalent bonded. You guys cool with that? Which one of these between nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen do you suppose is held together more tightly? The nitrogen, right? The nitrogen is much harder to break that bond. You guys okay with that? Oxygen, a little harder, but it's, more, more, it's not as hard as nitrogen. And then hydrogen, well hydrogen molecules aren't held together very well at all, and that makes the hydrogen molecules, or hydrogen gas, very explosive, right? It tends to be explosive, it tends to break down very easily. You guys cool with that? So a covalent bond results in the, is, is due to sharing of electrons, and it is when metal, when non-metals and non-metals interact. You guys okay with that? You guys cool? So far so good? Okay, so you okay with ionic bonds, or are you okay with covalent bonds? Makes sense, more or less? Awesome, awesome, all right. Now, going back to ionic bonding. When something becomes a negatively charged ion, its name changes. When I become negatively charged, my name changes. It's kind of like a marriage, okay? It's kind of like a marriage. Typically, somebody gets their last name changed, right? So when chlorine gains an electron and becomes negatively charged, its name changes and we call it, right? It is an anion, an ion that has a negative charge, and we call that chloride. Good, chloride, I-D-E. So when you see that, I-D-E, chloride, that is an atom that has gained an electron. You guys call that? So oxygen, if oxygen gains electrons, it would become ox, fluorine would become fluor, I. Does that make sense? When an atom becomes positively charged, its name does not change. So when sodium becomes positively charged, it's still sodium. When potassium becomes positively charged, it's potassium. When magnesium, magnesium. Does that make sense? It's only when I become negatively charged does my my name changed when I become an eyed. You guys cool? Cool? Make sense? So far? So good? Awesome. All right. So that is the foundation of chemistry. Okay. That is where all subsequent knowledge of chemistry is going to kind of, kind of come from right there. Okay. So let's talk about some general chemical reactions we're going to have to be aware of for this class. <clears throat> All right. The first chemical reaction is actually pretty easy, um, and maybe I'll maybe I'll try to color code this here. Um, so I have some molecule, and it has atom A chemically bonded. It may be covalent, maybe ionic, but A B, okay. And a decomposition reaction would be 
that molecule breaking down into its individual parts, or to different parts. So that would be A plus B. That's a decomposition reaction. It decomposed. Does that make sense? It fell apart. And this is a very common reaction in the body, okay? It's a very common reaction, and in fact, one of the most common decomposition reactions that you need to be aware of is something known as a hydrolysis reaction. A hydrolysis reaction. A hydrolysis reaction, or a hydrolytic, lytic means to lyse or to break water down, right? What we do is we actually break a water molecule down and we insert that water molecule Okay, half of the water molecule goes to A, half of it goes to B, and that allows the A and B to break down. So it's going to look something kind of like this. You have A covalently bound to B. Okay, and what I do is I bring a water molecule in. What's water? What's the molecular structure of water? That is a H2. So two hydrogens and one oxygen, right? And what I do is I can break that water molecule into hydrogen and OH, right? There's one hydrogen, there's two hydrogen and one oxygen, right? And the hydrogen will go here to the A, the OH will go to the B, and that will allow us to break that bond between A and B, and that will give us A bound to H plus B bound to OH. Very common reaction. Um, this is actually how we break proteins down in our body. Proteins are broken down through hydrolysis, which is a decomposition reaction. You guys okay with that? So when you, we eat meat or we eat something that has lots of proteins and we need to break those proteins down to digest them and to, to use them, um, that's typically going to be a, hy hy um, a hydrolysis reaction. Now we can also synthesize so a synthesis reaction is going to be what? Is it going to be breaking molecules down? No, it's going to be what? It's going to be building molecules. Good, it's going to be combining instead of breaking. So, <clears throat> excuse me, a synthesis reaction is just going to be A plus, let me just keep these caps off here, B, okay, gives us, A covalently bound to B or ionic or whatever. Okay, that's a synthesis reaction. The most common type of synthesis reaction that I want to talk about today is instead of a hydrolysis reaction, something known as a dehydration synthesis. And a dehydration synthesis is pulling a water molecule out. Half of the water molecule gets pulled out of A, Half of the water molecule gets pulled out of B, and then that allows A and B to combine together. Okay? So, remember when we talked about hydrolysis, where I broke a water molecule and I added half to A and added half to B to break AB down? Well, this is just the opposite, where I pull half of the water out of A, half the water out of B. Um, and let me just draw that for you guys. So, it would look something kind of like this. A, B plus H2O. Remember H2O okay, can break down into what? H and OH. Actually, we don't even have to worry about that because where does that water come from? A. There we go. Yeah. So I'm going to pull an H out of A, an OH out of B, and that's going to form H2O. And then that will allow A and B to combine. Okay, that is what we call dehydration synthesis. I'm pulling a water molecule out of those, those atoms or those molecules. Does that make sense? So when I break something down, decomposition, decomposition chemical reactions in the human body, okay, and when I build things, synthesis reactions, okay, breaking and building is known as metabolism. 
metabolism can basically be seen as the sum of all the chemical reactions in the human body. You guys cool with that? And the chemical reactions fall into a couple of general categories, either breaking stuff down or building stuff up. And metabolism that breaks things down is what we call catabolism. Okay, catabolism is breaking molecules down. And anabolism is building. It's building new molecules, like anabolic steroids, right? Help you build muscles with certain side effects, of course. <laughs> All right? You guys okay with that? Now, there are some other reactions that you want to be um, aware of. You can have what are called exchange or replacement reactions. And this might be an, a reaction where I have molecule that has atoms A and B, and then another molecule that has atoms C and D, and they react, and I get molecule A, C, plus B, D. What happened? Well, these guys traded places, right? That's called a replacement reaction, okay? Um, and then another type of reaction, or another uh, series of reactions, is either generally fall into what we call reversible or irreversible. Some chemical reactions will spontaneously reverse, and some may not spontaneously reverse. So whenever you see me draw a single arrow one way, so like AB becoming A plus B, okay it, okay, it broke down, okay, it decomposed. An arrow in one direction means that this type of reaction is what? Irreversible, Irreversible right? That means it would take a large amount of energy to put the A and B back together again, okay? But... If I were to draw something like this, where I have the arrow pointing okay, in both directions, that is a reversible reaction where it doesn't necessarily take a lot of energy to put A and B back together again. Okay? And the common example of a reversible chemical reaction in the human body is when your cells make carbon dioxide, right? Your cells make CO2 as a waste, okay? So CO2 can combine with water, H2O, okay? And it can form something known as carbonic acid, H2CO3, okay? And then H2CO3, so this here, this is a synthesis, right? This is a synthesis reaction. CO2 plus H2O synthesizes this, and then this, the carbonic acid, can actually break down into hydrogen ions. Okay, that's hydrogen without an electron, so H plus, and bicarbonate, HCO3 ions. Okay? And this would be a decomposition and what direction are those arrows in? Both directions. So these are reversible reactions. So I could take hydrogen ions and bicarbonate, and I could make CO2 and H2O, or I could take CO2 and H2O and make hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. I could shift the reaction this way and this way. Okay, this chemical reaction can occur in both directions. Does that, does that make sense? It's reversible. It can happen in both directions, and you don't need a whole lot of energy for that to occur. You guys, you guys cool with that? Okay. And as we move on and we start talking about more specific examples, we'll come back to these, these types of reactions. So far, so good, guys? All right. So let's move on to our next concept, the next thing that we need to know about. What we need to understand is Chemical reactions need to happen very quickly and efficiently in the human body. Most chemical reactions don't happen very efficiently or efficient enough for us to, to live. So there has to be some way of making a chemical reaction more efficient. And so 
when we just look at some general chemical reaction, okay, so imagine that this is energy and this is time. So I've got energy on my y-axis, time on my x-axis. Chemical reactions generally look like this. I have my starting, okay, I start at A plus B, for example, and we call those the reactants. the reactants. And generally for a chemical reaction that's going to occur spontaneously, that's going to happen without a whole lot of fuss, the reactants are going to be at a high energy. They're going to have high energy. And then what's going to happen is, okay, we're going to need to put some energy in to get over the in an energy barrier. And once we get over the energy barrier, the chemical reaction will proceed and then my new molecule, I'll either make or break something, and whatever that make or break thing is, is what we call a product. And for chemical reactions that occur spontaneously in the human body, the products are gonna be at a lower energy. Okay, and this is just kind of a, a thing that we found with the universe. Systems tend to want to go to low energies. There's just that tendency for, for, for systems, for, for atoms, for electrons to want to get to the lowest energy possible. Okay. But what's the problem here? Well, the problem is the amount of energy that I need to add to make this reaction happen. This is called the activation. This is called the activation energy or the delta E. Okay. Delta just means change. And in a lot of the chemical reactions that happen in the human body, the activation energy for these chemical reactions is high enough to where they don't want to occur very efficiently. So the human body has a very important kind of molecule. And it is a molecule that helps chemical reactions occur more efficiently. And these molecules are known as enzymes. Enzymes catalyze chemical reactions. They do not make chemical reactions occur spontaneously. What they do is they make chemical reactions happen more efficiently. And they do that by lowering the activation energy. Okay? So maybe this is a chemical reaction without an enzyme. And then this would be that same chemical reaction in red with an enzyme. What did you guys notice? What happened to the activation energy? Something went down. It's much lower. So it's much easier to get over that little hump there. So enzymes lower the activation energy, and they make chemical reactions occur more efficiently. You guys cool with that? Do you know what that was? Uh, what's that? What was that word you did? The activation energy. They lower the activation energy. They catalyze chemical reactions. They make chemical reactions occur more efficiently. Yeah. Do we produce enzymes yes. or do we intake enzymes? We make, make, we make enzymes, and I'm actually going to talk about how we make enzymes. Enzymes are actually proteins for the most part. Yeah. Are you guys cool with that? So far so good? Okay, cool. Um, so what I want to do now is I uh, want to talk a little bit about, um, yeah, uh, I'll go for a few more minutes and I'll give you guys a little break and then we'll keep going on. Um, I want to talk about acids and bases. Acids, bases, and water. So I'm going to start at water first of all. And water, like we said, is H2O, right? All right? And a water molecule looks a lot like this. An oxygen atom that is covalently bound to two hydrogen atoms. Okay. Now, where is oxygen on the periodic table of elements? Is it more to the right or the left? More to the right. Now, atoms that are more to the right, with the exception of the noble gases, 
The further up into the right you go on the periodic table of elements, the more what we say electro negative, more electronegative the atom is. Electronegativity means that in a covalent bond, there is unequal sharing. The sharing is not equal. And oxygen is very electronegative. It really likes to hog the electrons. Does that make sense? Um, chlorine, nitrogen, fluorine are all electronegative, right? Um, fluorine is actually more electronegative than oxygen. So what happens is oxygen is covalently bound to hydrogen, but the electrons around the hydrogen, do they spend more time by the hydrogen or more time by the oxygen? oxygen. By the oxygen, right? Because oxygen is more electronegative. So what happens is because the oxygen is pulling the electrons toward it, this part of the water molecule is partially charged. Okay. It takes on a partial negative charge. And because there is less electron density around the hydrogens, this part of the water molecule is partially positive. And when you have this difference in electronegativity, and you have a part, portion of a molecule that's positive and a portion of a molecule that's negative, we call this molecule a polar molecule. Water is polar because the oxygen pulls the electrons in, makes one side of the molecule negative and one side of it positive. You guys okay with that? And it is the polar nature of water that makes it unique because when you have lots of water molecules together, the water molecules attract each other, right? The negative part of one molecule is attracted to the positive part of another molecule of water. Does that make sense? Is that why water conducts electricity? Uh, yes, that is why water can conduct, can conduct electricity. Um, so, well, not, not, not to due to this, but due to, uh, and we'll talk about it here a little, a little bit, but due to the fact that water can break down and become ions. Um, and the more ions you put in water, the more it conducts electricity. Um, you guys okay with that? And this is in a really important part of biology. Whenever I attach a hydrogen atom, when I covalently bond a hydrogen atom to an electronegative, to an electronegative atom, okay, like oxygen, Okay. That allows this hydrogen to electrostatically bond weakly. It's a weak bond to weakly bond to other polar molecules. And when I have a bunch of hydrogens attached to something that's electronegative like oxygen, like this, when I have a bunch of water, for example, These hydrogens are attracted to the more negative oxygen. We call this a hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond. This is a very important concept in chemistry. It is not covalent and it is not ionic. Okay, it is what we what's known is an example of an intermolecular force or intermolecular bonding, hydrogen bonding. And this type of bonding is critically important for um, the formation of large, more complex molecules in the body that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Okay. But are you okay with why hydrogen bonding occurs? It's more what is it doing, sorry? It's more what? Um, you said the, it's bonded with the electro, it's more. When hydrogen is bonded to an atom that is more electronegative than it, oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine to be specific, that allows that hydrogen to participate in hydrogen bonding. And that's what makes water a liquid, is the hydrogen bonding between the water molecules holds them together and makes them liquid. But it's kind of a weak bond because water evaporates very easily, right? 
Um, so it's not the most, it's not the strongest bond, but it's enough to keep water together. And water is can, can be a liquid, right? Does that does that make sense? That's hydrogen bonding, and that's going to come up here in a little bit. Um, okay, guys, take five minutes, and uh, we will continue back here again.